Good evening. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ellery, for that introduction. Wow. I feel like, why me? Why am I up here speaking when so many brilliant individuals are at the conference today? I've been sitting here just taking note after note after note while people were on the panels, listening to them, and then my breakout session was the most awesome. I don't know about yours, but I'll tell you, breakout room number four rocked. <laughs> Number four. <laughs> so really, I did not prepare a speech for today. I took a lot of notes. And I just want to give some reflection based on what I gathered while I was here today. Before I do that, though, I would love for volunteers to raise their hand and express any thoughts or reflections that you had today. I know we've heard a lot with the panels and the speaking. We had our breakout groups, and I think we learned a lot there. But I wonder if people would be willing to just share their aha moments, their thoughts and reflections of today, just for a few minutes. Anybody? Anyone? Anybody brave enough? Come on, I'm sure there are. Okay, here we go. So as I've been sitting here listening to the yeah, panelists on. and listening in my breakout room just to hear the, the thought processes and things that everyone in this room has done to really better prepare our learners or individuals with disabilities to access, you know, the same resources that those without disabilities have. It's been a beautiful thing to see that we as a collective are coming together for a greater good. So I'm very thankful for that. Thank you. That's great. And I have to say that I really loved everything that you had to say when you were on the panel. It's, it's powerful to bring the boots on the ground people, those frontline people who are in a classroom doing this work every day to speak to a group like this. So thank you. I really appreciated hearing your perspective. Any more thoughts, aha moments, reflections? Anybody else want to share? Yes, one over here. I'll just follow up with that uh, with with a quote that you, Miss Young, actually made me think of during your presentation when you were speaking about um, the way you use voice to text on Google Slides. Um, I don't know if you all in this room know, but uh, Lin Manuel Miranda likely has dysgraphia. He's never been diagnosed, but he speaks about it often. And he, um, in sixth grade, received a on his performance evaluation from his teacher. His teacher wrote. Um, Lynn has some problems with the physical act of writing. I have suggested that he tape record some of his work. He has wonderful thought. I don't want the writing part to stand in his way. And so what may we not have gotten what may th maybe the world wouldn't have experienced had it not been from that teacher just like you. So huge thanks to all the educators in the room and just a good um, reminder, I think, for me and maybe, maybe you too, that it's so much more than just technical um, accessibility. It really is full participation in society and being able to be our whole selves no matter who we are. So thank you to the educators first and foremost and appreciate this space today. Yes, yes, thank you. That was awesome. Let's have just a couple more people. One more, two more, anybody else? Yes, right here. I have to thank our student ambassador here, Emmy, from coming from Fairfax County Public Schools. Yay, today. Emmy, <laughs> woo! She spent the room, she spent the, the day with adults as opposed to peers her own age, and, and hopefully it was a, <laughs> as a good of an experience as that could be, so. So uh, Emily's always been an excellent spokesperson for um, the, the technology tools and her educational experiences. And I can't be more thankful, and our educational teams at Fairfax can't be more thankful for her. So thank you, Emmy. Oh, and, and of course, thanks to Emmy's mom, who, if you didn't get to like any, have any introductions yes. with Emmy and her mother, she did not introduce her mother but her chauffeur. So <laughs> I, I, will, I will give you that credit, mom, for coming in today. So thank you for coming in also. <laughs> One more. Yes, right back here. Hi, I'm Louisa from Kahoot. Um, one thing that struck me was just the the different levels that we're all working at, right? Like the, the um, on the ground people working directly with students to product people to um, policy and like everything in between. And I know some of us have had conversations about how to make connections across those levels in, in research and academia. And um, I think it's just really struck me how we're all 
dealing with the same challenges and trying to raise awareness about the same issues but from different angles. So more of this collaboration I think is really meaningful. It is, yes. Thank you. Really, thank you so much for sharing what you experienced today. Today brought a lot of memories back of my own journey in the educational space. And I know that you heard my bio, where I've worked, and the things that I've done. Yes, I worked for the Obama administration. I worked for the Department of Labor. I pushed for policies for people with disabilities. I worked for the Department of Homeland Security. But today I was reminded of the importance of education. That is the fundamental basic human right. And the presence of the disability should not hamper a person's ability to really grab onto all of those possibilities that education can afford an individual. A person can thrive in society regardless of circumstances or where they are with education. So with all the educators here, the parents who are investing in their children's education, the policymakers, the advocates who work tirelessly. Um, Paul, gosh, Paul, I have known you for so many years. Your work, all of your advocacy, this is just so, so important. I oftentimes remind individuals that I'm an example of what is possible. I'm an example of what's possible when students with disabilities are given the appropriate tools and environment to thrive. Disability should not be a barrier to our success, to our achievements, to our dreams, to our goals, to our lives. It should, everything should just be determined based on the strength of our own work ethic, our own personality, our own drive, and our self-determination. These artificial barriers shouldn't be a thing. Discussions that happen like today, we need to think of the end goal. And that end goal is for people to have accessibility. And again, it's about people. It's about individuals. And they deserve a rich, barrier-free education. That education can allow them to reach up to their full potential. When I was eight years old, I became deaf in the beautiful country, the island of Jamaica. My family had no clue what to do with me. All of a sudden, they had a deaf child. So today, we talked about cultural competency a little bit in my breakout room. Because imagine this country. I came here as an immigrant from Jamaica. And then on top of that, the cultural elements where, for example, when I lost my hearing, my entire community was fearful of me because of the religious stigma that was attached to disability. So it was very demeaning and disempowering. I was terrified I was eight years old and I was just trying to make sense of the world around me. All of a sudden now, people were treating me differently. I was the top student in my class before becoming deaf. I was popular. And now all of a sudden, people shunned me. I was kept at home. And again, that's because the teachers and my family decided, well, she's deaf now, so she's no longer capable of receiving an education. So my life went from being the most popular, smartest kid in the classroom to a life of isolation. But I'm thankful for my mother. At that time, she was living in New York, South Bronx, and I was still living in Jamaica with my aunt. So my mom was able to focus on my immigration and moving me to the States. So I was 11 years old, almost three years after I lost my hearing, I moved to the States. I had no education during that time simply because of the fact that I was deaf. So I finally got to New York and I got into a mainstream school program in the Bronx that turned out not to be a good fit for me. Now, thanks to my special educator, the resource room teacher, she identified that I was not thriving in that main school classroom. 
Technology at that time obviously wasn't what it is today. We're talking about in the 80s, so there was no captioning. I had no interpreter. I think the most that was available maybe was an FN system, but I'm profoundly deaf compared to the other students in the mainstream classroom who had some residual hearing. That FM loop system wouldn't help me, so I was expected to lip read, which was not working. Obviously, today, we talk about artificial intellig intelligence, speech recognition, etc. So much technology is available today that wasn't then. Fortunately, I was able to leave that mainstream program and was placed into uh, the Lexington School for the Deaf in Queens, New York. There were a lot more opportunities for me to integrate there and also for the first time in my life to meet deaf children. In Jamaica, I thought I was the only kid in the world who was deaf. I didn't know sign language until I got to that deaf school and that was a life-altering experience. As a deaf person, I finally realized all of these years, I have internalized ableism. Do you know the term ableism? Ableism is how mainstream society views a person with a disability. How they determine our worth and how they determine what we are deserving of. So I had internalized all of those negative viewpoints, so that ableism, and when I got to that deaf school, everything I believed I realized was wrong. There were teachers who were deaf, and I thought, how can that be? So really, for me, that was the beginning of my journey. I was like a sponge. I just soaked everything I could up at that point. I share my story with you today because accessibility and education equal possibility. I shudder to think of what my life would have been like if it weren't for the ability to come here to the United States, the land of opportunity, and access all of the wide resources that are available through IDEA and through special ed. That helped me to achieve my dream. And people applaud me and say, Claudia, you're the first deaf black deaf female attorney, but I'm quick to remind everyone there are countless other people who are out there who are just as smart as I am, just as capable as I am, just as ambitious as I am, but they never had the chance that I did. They didn't have the chance. So our work, your work, is to empower these people and give them a chance, like Emmy and other people that are here today. Give these people a chance. When you go into the classroom every day or when you work on policy every day, just think, I wanna make more Claudias. And again, I'm just an example. I'm not an exception, I am an example, right? I'm not an exception at all. I'm a humble woman and every single day I'm reminded of why this work is so important. I know what my life would have been like without it. I go back to Jamaica every year. I just was there this January. And while the, you know, interpreters and accessible ed tech, all these things we talk about here, there are finally two young ladies in Jamaica who are deaf who graduated from the university last year. They had to pay for the interpreters themselves out of pocket. And I congratulated and celebrated them. And I share that to remind you that in the United States, yes, we have a lot of work to do. We're not perfect, but we have come a very long way. There is so much possibility here. There are vast opportunities if you think about it. Compare America to other countries and you will understand that. So I wanted to share that just to put this in context. This work is about our youth, but it's also about our future, about our country. We are responsible to create that next generation of leaders, of teachers, of policymakers, and individuals with disabilities are a crucial part of those populations. Representation of those communities. So we need to prepare them to do this work that we're currently doing today. Keep me posted on time here. <laughs> I did write some notes today that I just wanted to highlight with you and hopefully what resonated with me resonated with you as well. 
Roberto this morning from the Department of Education. One thing that he said that I really appreciated, especially as a person who is a black immigrant and a woman, Roberto said, not just for some, but for all. That was part of a statement that he made. He was talking about educators on the front line, and he was saying, remember why you're doing this work. So he was talking about the why. That's so important. I have experienced so much discrimination in my life. My mom was a poor single mother. I received my first TTY, we didn't have a phone back then, but my first TTY when I was 18 years old. My mom couldn't afford that. My mom had no idea what a TTY even was. I learned about TTYs with my deaf peers at school. Captioning, television captioning. I won a captioning box. Back then, captioning wasn't built into your television. You, had a, you know how it was, right? You had that separate box that hooked up to your TV, and you had to pay for that box. So fortunately, I was involved in Miss Black Deaf America, that pageant. And the prize, one of the prizes I won was a captioning box. So yes, I had captioning. I was 18. 18 years old. So all those years I would watch television, have no idea what was going on. There were no captions. That was before captions were mandated. And today those are mandated to be built into the physical television. So that line, not just for some, but for all that Roberto said, really resonated with me. I mean, for one, we're talking about affordability and also outreach really outreach, because sometimes I find these spaces to be a, a bit elitist, to be frank, and no offense, but you know what I mean. It can be a bit elitist. So how do we make sure that this information and these resources about what we know is available trickles down to those multiple marginalized community? Like me, you know, I said, like, my group that I'm from, how would this triple, trickle down to me? My mom worked a job that wouldn't allow her any time off. If she had time off, she wasn't paid. So she didn't have the luxury of going to the different agencies to navigate that system and figure out what was even available to help me. So again, outreach to those underserved communities, bringing this information to these people and really meeting them where they are. So coming down outside those ivory towers to get this information to the world. We also need to talk about language barriers in these communities. When we're doing this kind of outreach, language needs to be considered. So holistically, I'm sure many of you work in a school environment, you're on the front line, boots on the ground every day. Lexington School for the Deaf, my high school, at that time we had 28 different languages spoken at my school because I was in New York. So what does that mean in this space for accessible ed tech? And that goes back to many people talking about innovating and developing with individuals who have disability, partnering with people with disabilities, with not for. So I applaud, uh, here we go, I'm sorry, your name again, I forgot. Yes, uh, yes, 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 I applaud you for Sign Speak. I see your efforts and I see you developing this tech and I know I have seen some stuff in your field before that I'm like, oh, really? But the innovation of working with people with disabilities like you're doing, using resources wisely, if you don't do that, then whatever you're producing isn't beneficial for the community in the end. You also have to remember bias seeping in, regardless of the space. And accessible ed tech, bias can seek in here too. And lastly, technology is not the answer to everything. In our breakout session today, that came up. And that's always a caveat for some disabilities like interpreters. And I know that cost is always a consideration you know, in this world and everywhere, cost is a factor. 
Now with AI, every company now, every organization is looking how they can cut cost by depending on technology. We have to be principled though. And we have to recognize that we also have to incorporate quality of life. For me, example, I have an app on my phone. I pull this app out every single day, several times a day. I go to the bank, I go to the grocery store, I use this app. But if I'm in a meeting that I can't get an interpreter, I know this app won't be 100% accurate, but I can pull it out. So I think we have to be disciplined. We have to be mindful that technology, though it's great, it's empowering, it's enabling, but still sometimes that human intermediary still needs to be there. Other concept that I think is important for researchers and developers that are here, I heard this today, accessibility by design. And I know this is a concept that Microsoft has been pushing. Build accessibility in from the get-go. Develop with accessibility in mind. Make sure that disability talent is part of the creation. They should be some of the creators. One thing that I wrote down, Emmy, I, I adore you, Emmy. I mean, I applaud you. You are so mature, well beyond your years. <laughs> but one thing that I really feel it's important to emphasize is choices. Choices. It's a simple word, choice, but powerful. I really appreciated that, Emmy, you were able to speak to all of the different range of tools that are available for you, for your type of disability, for dyslexia. So you were able to try all of these different tools. And the fact that somebody who worked for you, say maybe two years ago, this tool worked for you, but it doesn't work for you now. Like you said, you're taking more advanced courses. So your tool needs change over time as well. It's important that we proceed with flexibility and with an open mind. This is an interactive process, so we need to determine solutions. There's definitely no one-size-fits-all. And these needs will change over time. So choice is important. And I have had situations where, um, this is a true story. I have had a situation, I went to work at the White House, and one of the first things that I requested was a video phone. A video phone. And it was new at the time. TTY is typing your conversation then and having to call a relay operator. It, it just took much longer to have regular conversations. I mean, at the time, we were thrilled to be able to make a phone call independently, so we didn't care that relay took longer. But fast forward to 2009. Technology had advanced at that point. So I asked at the White House for a video phone. My job was public engagement, which meant I would engage with deaf people, for example, National Association of the Deaf. If I call the CEO, I want to communicate with them directly via video. The White House said, ooh, Claudio, no video phone. No, no, no. Two, we can't do that because of security. Here's a TTY. Now, most people in the deaf community were no longer using TTYs. So my preference, my choice, was a video phone. That was emerging technology, and that's what I wanted to use. But I really had to go to bat for that. It took a couple of months before I was finally able to get a video phone. And several features were disabled because of security reasons, but I got a video phone. So the reason I tell you that is because you as educators, as researchers, as developers, Mostly educators, though, because you're the people making decisions, working on those IEPs, working on what's available for these students. You really need to be on the cutting edge. You can't give them outdated, antiquated tools because that's what you know. 
So you need to stay on the cutting edge and take training. So Emmy, that's what I appreciated about your comments. You were able to navigate through all of those different resources to figure out what is best for you at that time in your educational journey. I have two minutes left, I see. I have so many more notes that I took. Just a few final thoughts, though. As we continue this work that we started today and the cross-sector of collaboration, the silos, I think we would all succeed when we all succeed. So this shouldn't be a competition. We are more successful when we can collaborate. At the end of the day, I assume that our objectives are similar. We want to set people with disabilities, students with disabilities, up for success. We want to empower them. We want to give them the tools to thrive. So this type of collaboration that's happening here today is key for this space. We provide technology, which is great. Accessible ed tech is terrific, but don't forget about the other wraparound services. Teachers, educators need to be trained on how to use the resources. Parents perhaps also need to be trained. If a student is allowed to bring the equipment home or has you know, similar equipment at home, especially cultural barriers, linguistic barriers at home. So we must think big picture here. We can't just focus on ed tech for the sake of ed tech. What are the other wraparound services needed? Sometimes human assistance is needed to maximize the outcome. So this wraparound service, think about a holistic approach. I think that's very, very important. And as a person, who represents multiply marginalized communities, we must embrace intersectionality. Race, gender, socioeconomic status, conditions, etc. Intersectionality is important, and that also includes affordability. When we are giving the students a wide range of resources at the school, what's happening at their home? Again, it goes back to thinking holistically. I am humbled to be with all of you today, and I really applaud your work that you're doing. I applaud all the organizers, Department of Ed, New America, for hosting this type of conversation that took place today. I hope this will continue and can be a model for other sectors. Collaboration is the key to our success. Thanks for having me here.